Welcome to this brief explanation about the coercion cycle. I wanted to take a minute to share what research has shown us about the coercion cycle and how the coercion cycle, if we understand it, can help improve relationships, especially within the family. But before we get into too much of that, we have to first go over the definitions about coercion and the coercion cycle. There are two different aspects when we think about coercion. Um, coercion as in coercive relationships, or coercion as in the coercion cycle or the coercion theory. Coercive relationships are by definition hostile. They're all about control rather than autonomy and giving people freedom and individuality. And they're all about punishment as a way to maintain control and authority over people. However, the coercion cycle is just a theoretical conceptualization of behavior interactions that helps describe relationship dynamics in a way that helps us understand how we can intervene and interrupt negative interactions. So the coercion cycle is not inherently pathological in and of itself. All natural relationships evolve and have the coercion cycle within them. It is a tool that is used to escape aversive stimuli, and I'll give you an example in a sec. And it builds on itself until it becomes an automatic response within a relationship. So building on itself to have, be automatic might be good or bad. And so let me explain what that means in a positive manner so that it's a tool that's used to escape aversive stimuli. For instance, let's suppose that you have a infant who is crying because they're either hungry or their diaper needs to be changed. So the infant has an aversive stimuli. They don't like having their diaper dirty and they may be hungry, so they need to get out of that somehow. They don't have the ability to communicate, so the only way they can communicate is to cry. To an adult, crying is an aversive stimulus, so they don't like to hear that crying. So in order to stop the crying, the adult learns to take care of the needs of the child. It's so the cycle is not in and of itself pathological. It leads to positive communication and a positive interaction between parent and child. However, when it becomes negative is when it can lead to aggressive antisocial behaviors, which is what we're gonna talk about next. So a lot of the research on the development of aggressive behavior in oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder or antisocial aggression points to the coercion cycle as the nexus point of when that all begins. So oppositional defiant disorder is a disorder that has to be viewed in the context of relationships or an environment because a person cannot be oppositional or defiant in a vacuum. They have to have authority figures there. Um, so let's talk about and think about the development of ODD in the context of the coercion cycle. So to give me a, a little bit more better understanding, it's important that everybody understands that most adults have a very difficult time with this. Um, what we as adults believe and have this innate desire for children or people who are younger than us or people who we're supervisors over or we have authority over to listen and look up to us. When they don't, it creates aggression in us or them. And so some of the interventions that go to help dis disseminate and de decrease the coercion cycle are actually counterintuitive. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. So let me go over real quick a brief explanation about what the coercion cycle looks like and how you can identify it in your own relationships. So first, we're gonna go through a parent-child dynamic. So a parent or a child gives a command. Suppose that this is a parent to a child, so the parent tells the child to clean up their toys. If the child is compliant, then other interactions continue in a positive manner. So the parent then only has to give that same command next time so that the child can comply. The parent learns that the child will comply by doing this particular command and the child learns that they'll get what reward it is, whether it's having their parents stop asking them to do it or uh, desert at the end of the day if they do what their parent tells them to do. However, if there's non-compliance, 
then the command is escalated. Oftentimes the parent gives the command again with a little bit more firm voice, um, a little bit more aggression, or a little bit more possibility for a punishment. If compliance takes place there, then other interactions continue. If compliance does not take place, this cycle loops a couple of times. It repeats itself so that the parent continues to escalate and the child continues to escalate in their defiance. Escalation continues until we get to a point of aggression or violence, which then creates acquiescence on the part of the parent or the child. If the escalation gets to a point where the child is finally decides, I just need to give up because that's not gonna, not come out, I'm not gonna win this, then they acquiesce and other interactions continue. The problem with a coercion cycle is, for instance, if the um, parent learns that it takes this level of escalation to get a child to behave, then the next command will automatically come at this level of escalation. If the child learns that it takes this level of escalation to get the parent to back off, then the parent might give a very simple command like go and get your shoes on and the child escalates to here to get the parent off their back. That is the coercion cycle in a nutshell. So here are some important changes that result from the coercion cycle that need to be kept in mind as you think about the interactions with your own children or with the people that you interact with yourself. First of all, there's an overly inclusive classification. What that means is that if you're entrenched in the coercion cycle, then minor or neutral behaviors from the child become seen as problematic. And so the escalation starts really quick at that point so that the adult escalates very fast in their commands. It's almost like a zero tolerance or a three strikes you're out um, mentality. They did this and this and this, and so now if they look at me wrong, they've automatically gotten this level of punishment. There's negative attribution that takes place. So adults or caregivers or, or parents have a very difficult time labeling any positive attributes about the child in question. Almost all the qualities that they can think of or that they talk about are negative. The next thing that happens is a punishment acceleration. And what that means is that harsh pun punishments are used, like scolding, complaining, or threatening very difficult punishments. Again, this is kind of like the three strikes you're out, no zero tolerance policy. That for instance, if a child has had a lot of difficulty with a school and they say something wrong to a teacher, then that child becomes suspended for a couple of days. So the punishment acceleration happens and less judicious and timely punishments are used which then leads to the child being non-responsive to positive social stimuli, which means positive reinforcements become less effective. If you try to help children by overly embellishing and giving them lots of positive reinforcements, but they're this far entrenched in the coercion cycle, it's not gonna go anywhere. So there's other ways that we need to go about doing this. And then lastly, there's emotion regulation difficulties, and this is for both the parent and the child, or the adult and the child. Adults entrenched in, in the coercion cycle have a very difficult time regulating their emotions, and so what happens is they pay attention to this over-inclusive classification. They look at smaller behaviors, and they try to intervene quickly because they don't want to blow up. They don't want to have those big explosions or arguments that could result from um, going down that coercion cycle. So those are really important changes that take place as a result of the coercion cycle being fully entrenched in family relationships or in relationships between a teacher and a student. So um, how do we stop this? So what are some possible solutions to interacting with the coercion cycle and improving those relationships so that we can increase compliance with kids 
and decrease the emotion dysregulation that adults and children face. The very first thing is to ignore negative interactions short of violence. So you want to have a better understanding and a better picture of those negative interactions that might be not really important. So essentially this is a, a pick your battles type of solution. You don't get involved in really small, really trivial things because then that just continues this, the coercion cycle to become more entrenched. Secondly, you want to introduce non-contingent positive interactions. And what I mean by that is interact with the child in a positive way that's not contingent upon any positive behavior from the child. For adults or for parents, I ask parents to spend at least 15 to 20 minutes a week where they are with their child doing something the child likes to do that's not contingent on the child having a good week. It just, the child's a member of the family, and so they get this positive interaction regardless. Teachers can do this as well by having non-contingent positive interactions built into their um, relationships with students, so that way it can build up that, that sensitivity to positive reinforcements. Another thing is to maintain a seven to one ratio. And what that means is seven positive interactions or behaviors to every one negative interaction or behavior. So as adults, if you find yourself punishing children or um, correcting them a lot, then you need to do, give a lot more positive interaction, positive social um, reinforcements as you go about your day to match that ratio of seven to one that can help decrease and increase or decrease their uh, negative attribution feeling, but also increase your, their sensitivity to positive social stimuli. And then lastly, and this can be really hard for a lot of adults, but decrease your requests or command to about five per hour. Kids are inundated with requests for, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, if you just think about the typical family waking up and getting ready for school, a mom might, or a dad might say, hey, you need to get up and get your shoes on and then go eat breakfast. And the child at that point doesn't listen. And so you say again, I need you to get up. You need to get up and get your shoes on. You need to brush your teeth and you need to go and get your backpack. Right there in about 15 seconds, you've blown through all five commands in that 15 seconds. So a lot of research has indicated that the less commands there are, the more opportunity for positive interactions there is. Whereas the more commands there are per hour, there's a more likelihood that children will become non-compliant. So we get this dichotomy, this paradox that with increased commands, we actually get increased non-compliance. With decreased commands, we get increased compliance. So those are some things to keep in mind. If you have any other questions or um, any other thoughts about how to interrupt with the coercion cycle, feel free to contact me at my office. I'm more than happy to help any family who is looking for um, help in this regard. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good day.